Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Uh, we're out here in the woods right now, and we're just taking a look at a whole lot of this. That's the Hesperus matronalis. We, uh, we spotted it on the road the other day. On a trail right now, Hassan Creek Trail, and you can see these guys are abundant. Let me give you kind of a full panoramic here. We're just on a hill, slightly off the trail, and you can see uh, there's no shortage of these guys. This is kind of one of the issues with unchecked invasives. There's no, there's no herbivores in this area to consume all of these plants, so they just go unchecked. You can see though that go, gone unchecked, these guys can reach a significant height. This guy right here, at least four feet tall off the ground. Pretty impressive for something that lives about two years at the most. Get a load of this guy. Uh, your first instinct reaction might be to identify this guy in Asteraceae due to its, its dense capitula that is a, a flower head composed of actually a bunch of different little flowers. And it's surrounded by these, uh, these bracts on the edge here. And you'd be right, this is in fact an Asteraceae. It's, a, it's in the, the sunflower family. This guy is Pacera obovada. Common name, uh, round leaf ragwort, and you might notice it's called round leaf ragwort because, well, this is its leaf. It's round. This guy is a, is a perennial, so he grows back every year uh, until he dies. And uh, he's a native to eastern North America. Now you'll notice that this, this one individual specimen is totally and completely surrounded by the Hesperus matronalis, because... You know, that's how invasives work. There are insects who have lived in North America for hundreds of thousands of years that eat this guy, they eat the, the Pacera obovata, and near nothing that eats all that Hesperus matronalis. Anyways, hey Ant, what's going on? What do we want to call this today? We want to call it Dame's Wart? We want to call it Queen's Wart? We want to call it Dame's Rocket? Actually, this one in particular is worth noting because this is clearly a hybrid between the pink and the white ones. Generally speaking, when you have plants of two or any organism with two different colors reproducing, you're going to have a chance of one color, a chance of another color, your dominance and your recessives, and there's going to be a very small chance that, that they express both of the genes. So they, they hybridize the color, and that's what you could see here. This Hesperus matronalis, it's got a bit of white, a bit of purple. It looks looks pretty neat. I wonder if it's working out for him though. I wonder if, I wonder if uh, pollinators are more drawn to this this differently colored one. If that's the case, you'd expect to see more of it in the future as it's uh, being selected for by the pollinators. Probably be best if we maybe take a moment to appreciate some of the less uh, maybe colorful and vibrant plants in the area. Take a look at this guy. My first instinct when looking at this guy was uh, some kind of rose family, right? Because of all these, these thorns on here. And that isn't wrong, actually. This belongs to the family Rosaceae. You'll see I have these, uh, these juvenile, undeveloped flowers uh, right here all across this plant. So it wasn't super easy to maybe ID it pretty confident in saying that this is Rubus occidentalis. That is the occidental, meaning eastern. This is the eastern blackberry. Native to eastern North America. Long before it ever produces its, its berry fruit that would make it distinctive as the flowers themselves haven't even been developed yet. These guys are going to develop flowers. Uh, they'll be finished by the summer probably. They'll get pollinated and they'll develop their fruits by autumn. Rubus occidentalis, that's the eastern blackberry. So you'll notice here something kind of odd on the, uh, the surface of this part of the trail. This right here uh, is an oyster shell. And there's a big old just pile of these oyster shells over here. That is curious. What what are the what what are oyster shells doing here 
in eastern Pennsylvania. There are certainly no seas nearby. There were seas here hundreds of thousands of years ago, but an oyster shell would certainly break down over that period of time. Just get a load. Just how many these oyster shells there are. So this here will start to answer some of our questions. Let's get a closer look. So it's really not an interesting read, but you could pause it if you really want to read all this. There, there was a cement company out here. So this, this, this cement company existed here for about uh, the first half of the 20th century. We just got uh, this fallen tree that someone decided to put a bench next to. Not, not only a bench, but also some pajamas. This explains the oysters. This company would have clam bakes uh, on this, this property every summer. So all over the place, throughout the woods, you'll just find big old piles of oyster shells. Is this a huge problem? No, not really. Over thousands of years, those oyster shells will decompose and just return calcium and whatnot into the soil. Not a big problem. But uh, it's kind of a dickish thing to do, don't you think? Just, just throw out your oyster shells, or better yet, go dump them in the sea somewhere so those min minerals, you know, go back to where they came from. That'd be, a, that'd be a good idea. Oh yeah, I mentioned this place is called Hassan Creek. That's because, uh, well, there's a little creek. It's totally still right now. But uh, as I approached it, I came across some frogs. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, we got Hilaria petiolata uh, growing out inside the middle of Barbaria vulgaris. That is the yellow rocket cress. Just one mustard uh, kind of being a dick to another mustard right now. That's always fun to see. We spotted some frogs in this water, but uh, it's kind of hard to get them on camera here. I think I know uh, a certain tool we're going to need. All right, guys, so I got, I got to get a load of this guy lens. We're just going to try to slowly creep up to another section of the creek here. Problem is this part of the creek is really overgrown, so you really can't uh, make out much. We got something growing here. Do I ID it? I, I guess I got it, right? Growing out of the the creek here, you see all these little little blue flowers around the place. This guy is, of course, Myosotis scorpodes. That is the water forget me not. Is that too dark? Let, let, let me bring that up for you. That's, of course, a classic barrage, Barraginaceae, a.k.a. the Forget-Me-Not family. Looks like we got some sort of uh, waterfall spiel down here. There's a, there's a path down, down this way, but I think I'd rather take uh, that path. Looks less inclined to, to bust my ass. So this, this is probably about the end of the video here. I don't know how uh, well my audio is coming through over the, the little waterfall, but we made it to this little end of the creek here. Of course, you've got some more asparagus up there. You've got you know, a state route up there. You know, obviously, it's uh, it's not super tall. It's, not a, it's no Niagara Falls. But what more could you really be asking from a creek after all? This isn't even a river. We're talking creek. And let's get one final shout out to our Eurasian friend. No, wait, wait a minute, this isn't his first match for Nellis. Oh, is it? Oh, no, no, give me a second. So you might see how I might have, at a brief glance, mixed up the Hesperus matronalis for this different flower we got over here. This guy right here is uh, Geranium maculatum. That's from the family Geraniaceae, the, the Geranium family. This guy is a native to uh, North America. So these flowers here have five petals, ten stamens, grouped together in umbrals of uh, usually about five. What is this? Yeah, that's five there. That's, uh, that's about it for real this time. So uh, I'll, I'll catch you guys in the next one.